Welcome and aloha. I am Mark Schlav, the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Today we're going to meet with Hawaii lawyers who go across the seas and international borders as part of their professional activities. My guests are leaders within the Hawaii State Bar Association's International Law Section. I'll introduce each of them one at a time. They are Na Lan. Na is the chair of the International Law Section and is a director at Damon Key Leong Kupchak Astor. Rex Fujichaku. Rex is the vice chair of the International Law Section and is a partner at Bronster Fujichaku Robbins. Stephen Dyer. Steve is the treasurer of the International Law Section and is a partner at Chong, Nishimoto, Sia, Nakamura, and Goya, LLLP. Mark Levin. Mark is the director of the Pacific Asian Legal Studies Program, the PELS program, as we call it, and a professor of law at the William S. Richardson School of Law. Mark serves as a liaison or bridge between law school students and the international law section. I'd like to welcome all of you. Thank you all for being here. I've asked you to share your insights on international law and the Hawaii State Bar international law section. I'm gonna start with Na, you're the chair, so you get the honor of going first. Uh, tell us, what is the Hawaii State Bar Association's international law section and, and what are its themes and goals? Thank you, Mark. Uh, as we all know, HSBA is the professional trade or association for all attorneys licensed to practice law in Hawaii. Uh, it offers, to, in total, I think there are 21 op, uh, sec sections where active HSBA members, you can choose to voluntarily join a section. And where one of them is called the international law section. <laughs> Our section focuses on promoting collaboration, exchange events among legal professionals, uh, you know, between Hawaii and other jurisdictions. We sort of uh, function as the gateway. We hope to develop and maintain friendship network among our members and with other attorneys uh, whose law practice involves cross-border transactions or disputes and international clients. We offer a platform for our members to share access, connection, and resources within our section. And also we would sponsor events from other sister organizations who share the similar goals and mission as our section. Uh, we also support communication between uh, HSBA members and the uh, University of Hawaii Law School faculty and students with international interests. Okay, wow, that, that is a lot. And, and my, my next question, it will, will go to Rex, and that's a, a difficult question. What is international law in the context of the cross-border law practice that Hawaii lawyers are involved in? Well, thanks, Mark. You know, traditionally, there are two types of international law um, that you would learn in law school. You know, first of all is the public international law which is the law or the relations, the legal relations between nation states. And frankly, not a lot of lawyers practice public international law, especially here in Hawaii. I mean, there are a few people who may. Um, there are some lawyers with uh, the JAG at the, the Indo-Pacific Command here in Hawaii that may have to contend with international treaties uh, with some of our allies. And that pertains to some of the public international law regimes that uh, are applicable. For a lot of Hawaii lawyers though, it comes down to what's called private international law, which is about treaties uh, and some customs generally that may affect the citizen of country. And so these are international treaties for the most part that give duties and obligations and some rights for the citizens of these countries 
when they are caught in an international uh, situation. So for example, a lot of uh, litigators in, here in Hawaii may have discovery that they want to serve on people who are in other countries. And so there's a hate convention that pertains to taking deposition or serving subpoenas on people in other countries. And that lays out what needs to be done in order for valid service to occur. Um, I was just talking to an attorney who handles immigration issues and there's a hate convention on uh, child abduction. And that is really critical to sorting out the issues uh, when you have uh, kidnapping and other custody uh, disputes amongst couples who are in different countries. And so that is the type of private international law that is more prevalent to legal practice here in Hawaii that a lot of legal um, uh, professionals have to contend with. Okay, all right. And so more of a private uh, aspect. Uh, now I'd like to ask uh, Mark and Steve, any comments on that? Do you have anything to add to, to Rex's description of international comparative law studies uh, practice? Go ahead, Mark. Mark. Mark, I'll let you go first, You're professor. <laughs> well, I think, thank, thanks, Mark, for putting this together, and I'm appreciating everything that's been said. One of the things that comes out of studying particularly comparative law, comparative law means sort of looking someplace else and seeing what their legal system is, um, is a better understanding of one's own system. Uh, many places in the world don't have legal systems that look like ours. Ours is based in the Anglo-American legal system. And most of the world uses a system based out of continental European law. Um, it's kind of like the metric system is pretty standard around the world, but we don't use it so much here. So it's really fantastic if our students are gaining an understanding, not only of what they're doing here, but what happens elsewhere. And then from that, they take it back and they understand what's happening here better. Okay, so that, that's the pr professorial viewpoint. Steve? <laughs> yeah, I echo. First of all, Mark, thanks for putting this together and having us on. Um, I echo everything that's been said, but, um, you know, especially following up on what Rex said about uh, private and public international law, you won't find a lot of that here. And even in the JAG offices, you won't find that that much here. Uh, I was in the PACOM. JAG office for 17 years as a reservist. And uh, anytime we had a private or public international law issue come up, it was usually handled by uh, somebody up above our pay grade <laughs> in, in the Pentagon. Um, you know, we're just out here in Hawaii. But um, I think it comes up more here in Hawaii with cases involving different countries, different foreign, you know, foreign nationals who come here on vacation or are here for business and understanding that they're from a different system and from a different culture. And they might not know, as Mark said, our Anglo-American system or be used to it and helping them along and understanding their perspective in, ho in helping to resolve whatever issues they have. You know, so what I hear, what I hear from all of you really is a real practical uh, kind of personal down to earth practice of international law. And, and I, I wanna ask you each, uh, starting with Na, uh, you know, what is your personal background or professional experience that attracted you to working across international borders? And, uh, what is, and, and are you presently still involved uh, in that type of cross-border practice or, or you know, what, what are you doing now? So how did you get involved and what are you doing now? Nah, let's, let's start with you. Yeah, so I was born and raised in China, you know, which is a civil law country. So when I moved to the United States after I graduated from college and then started, uh, you know, studying in law school, you know, of course, U.S. is a common law country. 
naturally, I'm really, you know, curious about, you know, how these two social systems work, how people deal with similar problems in different approach. And I was also pursuing uh, the Pacific Asian Legal Studies Focus Certificate when I was in law school, uh, took Professor Wendai's international law class, which is fascinating. And, you know, after I, I graduated, uh, I, you know, passed the bar, started my practice, uh, you know, I speak Mandarin, so which is also very useful when I'm assisting, uh, you know, um, my clients who speak that language when they have, you know, either cross-border related uh, transactional matters or, you know, dispute resolution matters, or even sometimes I help my clients on probate, you know, estate planning issues when their assets could be located worldwide, the families are, you know, going to different jurisdictions to tackle issues. And on top of that, I practice immigration law. Uh, so this is really an area where I always, you know, close to my heart, my passion lies with it. I feel it's really meaningful to utilize my background, my language, and to, you know, um, do something useful to my clients, add values to their life. Wow, that's that's really cool. Rex, <laughs> what, what's your background and what are you doing now? Well, I think like a lot of people, Mark, uh, my interest in international law stems from my love of travel and my curiosity about other cultures and trying to learn and understand um, the different ways that we all live and, and try to get together in understanding uh, what our different cultures and our different legal systems are all about. So, you know, I studied uh, French in high school and in college and uh, studied abroad in college. Um, I also uh, did a master's program in uh, international studies and international law in particular. And after I graduated from uh, the William S. Richardson Law School here in Hawaii, uh, I started my career with the antitrust division of the Department of Justice uh, doing merger work. And I was on one of the first investigations where the department teamed up with what was then called the European Community uh, in looking at a significant uh, international merger that was happening. And so some of my initial work that I did as a young lawyer involved some international comparative aspects. And my present uh, law practice right now, I do deal with clients who have international operations, but mostly helping them out to understand how litigation happens here in Hawaii and help them understand how the U.S. legal system works. Well, that's very interesting, too. And, you know, uh, personal experience, it's kind of interesting that that's what drives you to professional uh, involvement. Uh, Steve, I'm going to ask you the same question. I mean, what, where, where are you coming from and what are you doing in the international? Um, yeah, you know, I grew up in the Chicago area. Uh, international law was maybe the last thing on my mind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing led to another. Uh, I wound up having a double major in economics and Japanese in college. And that led to a year abroad uh, in undergrad and then a two year fellowship uh, at a Japanese law school in Japanese. And so I had to get my Japanese to, to that level. Um, and then I joined the JAG Corps, which is probably the world's largest law firm and the most international of law firms. There's 2,000 Army JAGs worldwide. Um, so there's plenty of international law and internationally related issues that come up, uh, cultural differences, et cetera. So that's how I, I got my start. And then I, I stayed in the reserves when I went into private practice here and uh, at PACOM. And there were plenty of opportunities there to you know, be connected with international issues. And in private practice here, like Rex and now uh, we're saying, we're constantly getting clients and dealing with cases with issues that are, are cross-border, cross-cultural. And to me, that's part of practicing international law. No, that's very interesting. Again, I mean, it just your your personal experiences is driving you. Mark, 
uh, what please give us your your story so as i listen to my my friends here speaking what strikes me is their their first place to go is to talk about their work and of course that makes sense but i think it is true for all of us that there is a, a a blending that goes on we like the fact that we have connections across the sea it just happens to be law that helps us make those connections and so um, we, whether that's our clients, uh, our students, uh, or uh, other lawyers elsewhere that we have been fortunate to know, Mark, of course, you were very involved, I think, in helping the State Bar Association set up uh, an important relationship, for example, with the Tokyo Daiichi Bar Association. And uh, that has led to uh, visits where lawyers from Japan come over here um, and vice versa, where delegations from here have gone over to Tokyo and really meaningful, important friendships. Um, and so I think I don't want to downplay the work, um, but one of the things that I think is a part of why we do this is we like it. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to make these connections that have been incredibly valuable for me and I suspect for every, everyone else on, on today's talk. Yeah, and, and what I hear you also saying is that law facilitates, it, it, it's, it's funny, law facilitates the ar arrangements that we develop personally and we just combine them. I really like that summary. And now you're, you, you, Teach at the PALS program, or you're you're in charge of the PALS program. What what are your law students? Who are they, and um, what what do you teach them? What what are they taught? What are the benefits of that education? Well, uh, some of the benefits of that education are on today's uh, talk uh, because we have phenomenal alumni, including uh, Rex and Na. Um, Pacific Asian Legal Studies has been a part of the Richardson Law School pretty much since its foundation, and that fits uh, who we are, where we are, and why we do what we do. And so we have students who come here because they want a chance to learn about law from elsewhere and international law. We have students who come from elsewhere who want to learn about American law, uh, notably an LLM program which allows foreign lawyers to come and study with us for just one year. Um, and then I think we have this spinoff, this carryover. For many years, I was invited, or several of us were invited to teach uh, some classes in David Kelly's uh, real property class. So David would put a couple weeks in April where he would give up, let go of teaching uh, American property law and had myself, uh, Larry Foster, and Taehyung Beck uh, each teach classes. And so all of our students are then given this chance to learn that American law is going to likely going to be their career, certainly going to be the exam that they take when they graduate to get licensed. But it is both interesting and valuable to have an awareness of law that goes beyond the borders. And, and you know, let's talk to one of your, your students, Nah, I mean, how has that uh, international comparative law education helped you? And, and how does it help American and foreign law students once they start practicing law? I think one of the major benefits of learning comparative law is really it helps you to recognize problems and find model solutions without having to just rely on your own experience or imagination. You 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 learn how to respect the different perspectives where you know people live in different parts of the world view a same issue and sometimes you know an issue may maybe like uh some other areas people are addressing that issue already where in your place maybe that hasn't really gotten into that stage where you figure this is going to be a problem that needs a legal solution I think one of the good experiences uh, is when I attended the American Immigration Lawyers Association's conferences many, many years ago, the Europeans, they already come up with this law, GDRP, the General Data Protection Regulations, focusing on providing, uh, protecting privacy, cyber securities. And then, you know, the interesting part is like just uh, maybe a couple of years later, 
we read all this headline news in U.S. about all this data breach, you know, like privacies. But of course, you know, our country isn't taking this um, uniform regulations throughout the, on the federal level. Instead, we give each state this approach to address that issue. I think that's a very good example of, you know, how, you know, you, you have that background, then you you got to be better, identify issues for your clients, and also to deliver better solutions. When you can combine those resources, you can gain through that angle. Well, that, that, that really explains the uh, value of the education. Yes, Mark, what were you going to? I'd, I'd love to add one thing, which is um, all of us today are here on the island of Oahu. Um, and uh, But the HSBA International Law Section's membership uh, is worldwide. Um, and that includes Richardson graduates who have. So it's not just that we're training lawyers who are going to be in Hawaii, but we have been training lawyers who have gone out and have some of Richardson's graduates have major leadership positions in some of the biggest law firms in the world, particularly with regards to East Asia because of our PALS program, also with regards to international commercial arbitration um, and other opportunities. So one of the things that I think the PALS program has been able to do um, is uh, shape lawyers' career tracks for those who will be in, in, remain in, in the state, but also help develop career tracks for people who will go abroad, uh, go elsewhere, and then perhaps, and many of them in fact, come back. Okay, yeah, uh, it, it's, it sounds great. I mean, it's just this valuable um, law, education, and experience, and connections, networking. Rex, I wanna ask you, I mean, you know, after you've had that education, what advice would you give to young lawyers who are just starting the practice of cross-border law practice, transitioning from law school? Well, I would say, first of all, is try to be the best uh, lawyer that you can be. Um, know US law uh, as best as you can. And then you can apply that in dealing with you know, counsel from other countries. But the, to a certain extent, you have to get the fundamentals done. And for those who want to do international law, as we've been talking about, I think the, the, the other important thing is to talk to those uh, who are practicing uh, either comparative international law or any kind of trans-border transactions and network. And I think, you know, what, what's really important for your viewers to know is that your host, Mark Schwab, has been instrumental not only in establishing our international law section with the HSBA, but also is one of the founders of the Inter-Pacific Bar Association, which is a premier network of lawyers around the world. And it, it's an excellent opportunity to meet your peers and potential mentors um, who are practicing and just getting to know what it means to be an international law. Well, thank you very much for that uh, nice, nice words. I appreciate it. Uh, Steve, what practical, practical experience would uh, you suggest that would enhance a law student's education? You mean vis-a-vis -vis international law, if you're interested yeah. in that, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, I echo what I heard from Rex and uh, Nalan, but, um, you know, speaking of Mark Schlaff, um, <laughs> uh, Mark also, Mark and I are, he's my senpai. And for those of you who understand Japanese, you know that that means he's my senior and I'm his kohai, his junior. Uh, and the reason we have this relationship is because Mark attended as an undergrad uh, Sophia University's Euro abroad, Euro abroad program in Tokyo. Uh, I forget what years, Mark, but it was three or four years before oh. I did. Uh, yeah. Okay, we'll leave it at three or four, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so that's something certainly you can do, do a year abroad. Um, you'd be amazed how it opens your eyes to so many things, you know, not only language, but how people think differently and act differently and customs uh it's a really amazing so that would be one thing 
the other thing is go for it. Uh, try something different. Um, I don't mean to do it intentionally, but in my own case, joining the JAG Corps, that's kind of something that a lot of people don't think about is, oh, I don't want to join the military and the army and geez, I could get killed. Well, you could get killed walking across the street. Um, the opportunities for growth and, and like Rex said, networking, meeting people, uh, you know, encountering issues and cultures that might get you interested and pull you in or, or lead up to uh, a position or work or a job that you might be really interested in are, are unlimited really. Uh, and like Mark said, whatever you're doing, do it well. And uh, as long as you're honest and hardworking, the world's gonna be your oyster. Well, and, and what common thing I hear from all of you, and actually it affects us, all, all of us right now, is networking. We all network with each other over this international law and within the international law section. And that's how we got to know each other, be friends, and have a lot of experiences together, including in, in across borders. Now, we only have a couple minutes left. I'd like to ask each of you to briefly if you can, <laughs> uh, tell us, you know, what has working across international borders and within the international law section brought to your personal and professional lives? Na? I think the best part is making new friends like, you know, you know, our panel today, uh, you know, I get to know each of them on a deeper level. And also, of course, you know, whenever you come across issues, uh, evolving you can always know you have this support network who can share with you their resources as well so this is fabulous valuable that's really cool too the support network i like that i mean it's not just a network these are people that care about you and want to help you uh you know rex same question for sure just to quickly give a plug to the sections friendship agreements that we have with the Daiichi Tokyo Bar Association, the Shanghai Bar Association, the Seoul Bar Association, and we also have one with the Sicho Bar Association. Uh, these have been just invaluable uh, opportunities to make friends with foreign lawyers and really, really deepen the connection between those countries and Hawaii. And so it, it's just been a terrific opportunity. You know, that's great uh, when you talk about these other countries like China, where th there may be a lot of political differences, but we know and we have friends in China who are lawyers, who we know personally. That, that's a, a great thing. Steve, same question. Yeah. Again, I echo the thoughts, but uh, for example, this past Friday, so the last business day, uh, we had a Pauhana here at the firm to welcome uh, a new lawyer. And I, I walk in and, hi, I'm Steve Dyer. And she goes, hi, I'm, uh, I'll leave the name out. But she goes, I've heard of you because <laughs> I, I work with Martha Levin at the law school. <laughs> so there you go. I, yeah, I saw that coming. <laughs> well, 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 we'll let you conclude, Mark. Where, where, what are your thoughts about, you know, what as, you know, working across international borders and, and with the international law section, brought to you? Well, I'm going to say what it has brought to me, but me and my role as the PALS director at Richardson Law School and what it has brought. And I have so much appreciation for the people who are on this screen and for others who have helped make this happen is not just my networking, but building bridges and connections for my students. Um, for many years, uh, there would be regularly downtown lunch events um, and the students would hop in a car, share a taxi, find parking. Uh, it was all worth a free sandwich, um, but it was also a chance to meet um, people in the community uh, who were doing the work that they wanted to be doing. Um, and we know that time moves on. So those students who were hopping in those cars and going downtown, many of them, uh, like one about to go to, to Steve's office, um, will soon be working, established, moving their own careers along. And so I think what this section has also done for me 
in my representative capacity with the law school is been a, just a tremendously valuable, kind and generous uh, group of people to look to Kohai, to look to younger uh, aspiring lawyers and reach a handout to help bring them up. You know, wouldn't it be nice if the world was run like the international law section in a way where we're all friends, we're networking, we help each other out. Uh, I mean, we don't always agree, that, that, that's fine. But the, these personal relationships brought about by international law and international law practice and the international law section are really invaluable. So I'd like to thank you all for being guests today. Thank you very much. I uh, enjoyed our talk. It was it went fast. And uh, aloha to all of you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Aloha, Mark. Mark. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.